I had a cousin of mine, and I've talked, to him, I've talked about him a couple of times, that when he, came, when he was growing up in high school, he knew that he wanted to be in the military, and his goal was to join the Navy. And so he completed high school, he got his high school diploma, and he had gone to the recruiter's office, and the recruiter says, okay, everything looks pretty good here, you've got the high school diploma that you need, and you know, whatever else, say, oh yeah, make sure you go take a physical, and handed him a form, and he took it to the doctor, and <clears throat> the doctor went through everything, checked the blood pressure, you know, vision, height, weight, all that good stuff. And with the, the, his mother, my aunt, told me later on that he was getting ready to sign the document. Said, "Oh, hold on, before I sign this, there's one other test I got to run, and that's a color blindness test." And some of you may have taken a color blindness test. It's where they give you or they show you a card and it's got all these dots on there. And like most of the dots will be like blue, but in red dots, they'll be like the number five or the letter M or something like that. And you have to say, okay, what letter or what number do you see there? And the question is not can you make out the letter, it's so much can you tell the difference in colors? Because if you're, and there's different types of this, but there's something called color blindness where you can't tell one color from another. And Howard started looking at those cards and he could not see a single number. And that was when we discovered at the age of 18 years old that my cousin was colorblind to the point to where he can see black, white, and various shades of gray. And that's it. He'd gone all the way through school and this had never been caught. His mother told me, she said, I thought that when he was drawing a purple cow, he was just being creative, that's all. <laughs> it turns out he couldn't tell the difference between purple and brown and red or what have you. That colorblindness gene kind of runs throughout our family. In fact, I'm slightly colorblind. Uh, this came to notice one time a few years ago when Dusty and I and my sister and her husband were playing a board game and... We were passing out before someone had red pieces and someone had green. And I pushed some pieces towards my sister and said, here, you can have these. These are, these, are, these are yellow. And she said, those aren't yellow. Those are orange. I said, well, it looks yellow to me. That yellow, orange, red, somewhere in that spectrum, I have a hard time telling what one color is from another. It's just, you know, the way my eyes work. There are different types of blindness out there, you know. There's color blindness. Uh, there is nose blindness. Uh, when Dust and I were house hunting, we went in this one place where they'd had a dog that had obviously lived inside the house way more than a dog ought to live inside the house. And then this was a big dog I'm talking about. Because you walked in the door, it's like, oh, man. And I mentioned something. The homeowner was there. And I mentioned something to her about, you know, the smell of the, of the dog. And she said, I don't smell anything. And I'm like, you're kidding we got out of there and the realtor explained to me, she said, he said, she's become nose blind because she's been around this the whole time. She just doesn't see it. There's also things like night blindness. You know, and some of you may experience that where you have a hard time driving at night okay. because when, you know, when it gets dark, you just can't see. Then there is spiritual blindness. When someone is unable or unwilling to see what God is doing in our midst. And that kind of blindness, spiritual blindness, is to me the most tragic kind of blindness of all. If you've got someone that's physically blind, they can't see at all. I mean, that's difficult, of course, but nowadays we have like braille writing and we've got ways of getting you from point A to point B. Color blindness is a little bit of a frustrating point. My cousin, instead of going into the Navy, wound up going into the Air Force. Apparently, they're not all that particular in the Air Force. Go figure. But he's done a career there and did just fine. Uh, I have a sister-in-law that she's a graphic designer, and she tells me, and this blew my mind when, when she told me this, there are some graphic designers that are colorblind. And I said, how can, you, how, how can someone be a graphic designer and be colorblind? She said, well, they've memorized that this shade of gray corresponds to that shade of blue, and this shade of gray corresponds to that shade of red, and they memorize what colors work with each other. Spiritual blindness. If someone is unable or unwilling to see what God is doing, what do you do? Jesus, we've been talking about the beginnings of his ministry, about how he was in Capernaum, and the place was filled to capacity, and they lowered the guy down. 
He went on from there. He was up around, you know, you got Judea down here in the south. You got Samaria just above there. And then in the north, you've got Galilee. You've got the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum is on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. He was there for a while and then he went kind of eastward a little bit to a place called Gerizim. And there he ran into a man who was inhabited by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of demons. And Jesus freed the man. The demons were cast out. They entered some pigs. The pigs were running into the water. And the people around were, were not sure if they were scared of the fact that here's a man who would command demons. Or they're mad at the fact that he just killed their entire pig herd. We're not really sure what, which one they're most upset about. But they were afraid of Jesus and they wanted him to go no further. And so the man who had been set free wanted to follow Jesus. But Jesus said, no, go to your people there and let them see what I have done. You will be my messenger there. He then went back to Capernaum. There was a man's daughter had grown sick. Jesus healed her. And then he came to his hometown, Nazareth. Now, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, if you go back and look at Luke chapter 2. But he actually grew up in Nazareth. This was his hometown. This is where he spent his childhood. This is where he spent those teenager years. These were the people that he knew and loved so very well. And now local boy who's done good is coming home. But it was such a tragic homecoming. Open up your Bibles if you could please to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And he went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And, how the, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracles there except that he laid his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. Amen and amen. Here we have Jesus coming home to his home folk. I know that when Dust and I go up to Georgia, to Madison, where my mom lives, we're going to the town that I grew up in. And every time I go into Walmart or if I go in the grocery store or a restaurant somewhere, I always kind of look around to see if I can see someone that I knew from when I was a kid. Madison's grown a lot, so there's a lot of new people coming into that town. Nazareth wasn't growing quite like that, so it's likely that when Jesus came into town, there are still the people there that he knew. Probably not too many people that he would consider to be a stranger. So he comes in, and the people have heard about, oh, Jesus has done real well, and they know that he's taught some things, and they know that he's performed some miracles. And so on the Sabbath... It was as was their custom to allow him to stand up and speak. And it says that he began to teach in the synagogue. And someone was asking me earlier, what did he teach? And the answer is, I have no idea. I wish I knew what Jesus' sermon notes were like that day. But just like when he was at Capernaum and the house was filled to capacity, all we know is that he was teaching in some form or fashion. And they were absolutely astounded by what they saw. It says many listeners were astonished. But then look at what they ask. Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles performed by his hands. They could not dispute the miracles. The teachings really made them think. And they asked the question, how is this possible? But notice what they asked. Where did this man get these things? How did he do these things? 
They assumed that this was just simply Jesus, the guy that they'd known all these years. The idea that God was actually working through someone familiar to them? Inconceivable. Why are people blind to God? The first reason why people are blind to God is, number one, is we allow human assumptions to trump divine authority. They assumed that Jesus was nothing more than a person and that God couldn't work through a person. They forgot that God almost always works through people. God could have sent the burning bush straight to Pharaoh if he wanted to, but instead he sent it to Moses. He could have built Noah an ark himself and saved him a whole lot of trouble, but he said, no, I want you to build the ark. I want you to load everybody up on there, and I'm going to keep you safe. God could have appeared to David in person, but instead he sent Samuel with some oil and says, I'll show you the one. I want you to anoint. When you substitute your own reasoning for God's wisdom, you are setting yourself up for disaster. There's a passage of scripture that I learned a long time ago. It's in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord in all your ways and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Trusting in God, leaning not in our own understanding, and in all your ways, acknowledge him, and then he'll direct your path. And then, once he's given you the direction, you've got to decide, are you going to follow it? What we have to understand is that God does not always work like we want him to work. A young woman once asked her parents for more money, but they told her, no, you don't need more money. What you need is learn how to manage the money that you have. Someone asked for a better marriage, and the answer was, well, maybe if you want a better marriage, maybe you need to be a better spouse. The problem is not that God does not act. The problem is he doesn't act like like we want him to. Oh, God acts like this. God does this. God does that. God doesn't do this over here. We assume that we know what God is going to do. We allow our human assumptions to to trump divine authority. Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? Because we know Jesus wasn't that kind of smart. These miracles performed by his hands. And then in verse 3, is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary. Notice how they describe him as the son of Mary, not the son of Joseph. It could be, and scholars have speculated about this, we're not really sure. But it could be that the story of his birth had filtered its way even to Nazareth. And about how Joseph and Mary gave birth less than nine months after they became husband and wife. And maybe something fishy went on there. Mary had told Joseph that Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the man who loved her the most, who knew her the best, didn't believe her. What are the odds of everyone else believing her? That was in the town of Bethlehem. Nazareth, people are kind of like, something happened back then. We're not really sure what. So we'll just kind of roll with it. Until Jesus actually stood up in the synagogue and began teaching. They said, whoa, hold on a minute. This is the son of... Of Mary. Oh yeah, her. He's a carpenter. We've got his brothers and sisters right here. Yeah, I remember them playing around in my garden when they were kids. The second reason why people are blind is because we get hung up on the past. They knew Jesus as a teenager and they never could get that image out of their heads. It's because they were hung up on the past. You know, one of the things I've learned is you talk to Christians and they believe that Jesus did miracles back then. The problem they have is believing that he actually does miracles today. It's the same Jesus then as it is today. The same God, the same Holy Spirit. Because we get hung up on the past, we don't see what God is doing in in the present. There is a man out there by the name of Brian Welch. Turn out the, the code lights so they can see this picture pretty good. Turn out the uh, pulpit lights too.
Can anyone pick out the Christian in that bunch? Anyone want to take a shot at it? <laughs> Top center, the one lifting the hat off of his head. His name is Brian Welch. This is the heavy metal band Corn, spelled with a K instead of a C. And for many years, Brian was there in this band, and they were like you would expect any heavy metal band to be. They got the drugs, they got the alcohol, they got the women, they got all of that. But then in just a little while, we're going to hear his story about how God made a change in this man's heart. And it was absolutely profound. Now, here's the thing. If this crowd walked in this church today, how many would immediately write them off as they're beyond <coughs> redemption? I mean, after all, that's what they've been dressing like. And the kind of music they play is exactly what you would think it would be like based on their outfits. We forget that God is still in the business of making miracles. And God's still in the business of changing hearts. Okay, go ahead and lift the lights back up if you could, please. And advancing on to the next screen. And then in verse 4, Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. This verse right here is why it's generally understood that pastors don't succeed when they try to pastor the same church they grew up in. People just don't take you seriously because they remember you as a kid and they can't quite get that image out of their heads. I had a professor when I was in seminary that we got to talking about this one day and Dr. Root had all kinds of stories to tell us. Now I learned in seminary that there's what you learn from the material and then there's what you learn from the professor sharing their war stories. And you really you learn just as much as from the war stories as you did from any of the textbooks. But he was telling about the, how even though he was in his 70s and when he would go home on vacation, that they would still sometimes ask him to preach. And even though he says, even though I'm in my 70s, I'm still little Tom coming to preach. <laughs> Pastor, a minister, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. Here I'm typically called Pastor Chet. I answer just about anything. Please don't call me Reverend, but I'm called Pastor Chet here. When I go home and I'm with my family, I'm just Chet, which is a good thing. It, it, it really, really is. But the Jesus was in here when he's trying to minister to these people. He's trying to heal. And the response is, no, 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 no. You're just, you're just Jesus. I knew you when you were a kid. Even though they were in the presence of the living God, God the Son, they had become complacent. And him being nearby was no big deal. They knew Jesus, or at least they thought they knew Jesus, and so didn't, they didn't think there's anything special about them. The third reason why we become blind to God is because sometimes the holy becomes common. Well, yeah, holy becomes common. When I grew up, I grew up in a town, it's called Madison, Georgia, and if you Google it, you'll see that by U.S. standards, at least, it's considered a historic place because you've got a lot of homes that predate the Civil War. And in the state of Georgia, that's kind of an unusual thing because when Sherman marched from the north up around Chattanooga to Atlanta and down to Savannah, he burned everything in his path except for Madison because our representative to Congress was a known anti-secessionist. And so Madison was considered to be friendly territory for the Union soldiers. And so what that means is 150 years later, of all the towns that, that were in that part of the state where Sherman went, were the only ones that still have homes left that date back to before the Civil War. Well, growing up, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. You know? I got frustrated the tourists that were tying up the traffic so much during tourist season. But it wasn't until I moved off that I understood, okay, that was kind of a special thing. Because it had, become, it had become common, I was blind to the impact that it had. Because Jesus had become so common to them, they were blind to what God was doing. For the most part, and this is the tragic part of this in verse 5, and he could do no miracles there except that he laid his hands upon a few people. 
Interesting that we would say not that he did not or would not, but it said he could not. And the problem was this thing called belief. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him, belief. Belief, someone once said, is the hinge upon which the door swings that opens up to God's blessing. Unbelief is the hinge on which that door closes. The few people that, that were there that believed, those that had need of healing were healing. There were a few that said, I don't care what the others say about you. I know who and what you are. I know you're the Messiah. I know you're the Son of God. And he laid his hands on and healed a few sick people. And he wondered, he marveled at their unbelief. And he was going around teaching. God is still in the business of healing. Even when we think, oh, God doesn't work like that. God doesn't work in people's hearts. God doesn't, doesn't do miracles. Let me show you one of those miracles. Go ahead and turn the lights out and roll the video if we could, please. like, okay, I'm going to accept Christ in front of everybody right now. Then I'm going to go home and snort drugs until I don't want to do them anymore. And that was my way of thinking. So I received Christ at the church. I went home, neglected my daughter, and put her in front of the TV. I remember I grabbed a $100 bill. I always used a $100 bill for some reason, pride or something. I chopped up my crystal meth, got it all smooth and powdery, and I snorted a big old line. And I held the bill, and I looked up, and I said, Jesus, if you're real like that pastor said, then you gotta take these drugs from me. Come into my life, come into my heart. And I just got quiet. I said, search me right now, search my heart. And I stayed silent. And I said, you know I wanna quit. You know I wanna be a good dad for this kid. She lost her mother to drugs and she's gonna lose me if I don't quit. Amen. There's a high when you go on stage and you see all these people like just loving your music and loving you and stuff. And there's these girls and all these people going, worshiping me. When you see all those people just going nuts for you, it's like, you know, it, it puffs you up inside. You're like, you know, I'm important. That's where drugs can creep in. And, you know, cocaine or whatever, methamphetamines crept in. It all came from after drinking for me and, and my friends. And uh, it seems like fun in the beginning. It's a lie because it, it it turns around on you. It starts to wear on your personality. starts to wear on your relationships. And everything is affected by it negatively. Everything. There was a, a few times where... Life seemed good. My daughter, Janae, she came into the world and I was like, it was just such a, a euphoric feeling. I thought my life could just feel like that forever, you know? It was like a, it was spiritual, just, I didn't know what was happening. I just felt so much love just fill my emotions. And I thought I was gonna be happy, but, uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't stay sober. I didn't know how. <laughs> I hit rock bottom. I had swore that I would never do methamphetamines again because I saw what it did to my child's mother. It, it just took her feelings away and made her leave her kid. I just wanted her dead. I wanted to kill her. I thought she was the scum of the earth and uh, 
you know, how could she do drugs like that and let it, let the drugs win her like that? So I never was gonna do meth again. I ended up with a everyday crippling addiction to methamphetamine and everything that I said about my ex-wife came true for me. I sunk to the lowest gutter I could ever think of. I would spend time with my kid and I'd still be on it because I needed it to function. I'd get up in the morning, have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and snort meth and then take her to school or whatever. It was just, I was a junkie. I started losing my mind. This guy would show up at my house with like a gun and stuff. And then I ran out in Europe, had my drug dealer just crazy. send me drugs through through the mail. I tweaked out in my hotel room watching this package come from the U.S. It's just nuts. My life just was like spinning out of control. Janae had come out on, a, on one of the tours in the U.S. I just remember me. her skipping around the house just singing one of our corn songs called Adidas. All day I dream about sex. And I'm like going, what am I doing? I'm a junkie. My daughter's singing All Day I Dream About Sex. And uh, I'm gonna die. Father. My uh, real estate broker, Eric, he, uh, he said, Brian, I don't mean to be weird with you, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I, f I felt the scripture like jump out at me. I've never done this before, you know, so I don't really know how to do this, but I felt like this would mean something to you. It's Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I remember all tweaked out. I looked up in the dictionary, weary. I looked up burdened, and I just I pulled the scripture apart, and I was like, oh, I'm weary and burdened, and I need rest for my soul, and uh, I didn't know if it was real, but the, you know, they invited me to church a couple couple weeks later, and I received Christ at the church. I went home, neglected my daughter, got it all smooth and powdery. Jesus, you got to take these drugs from me. Search me right now. Search my heart. Father. I felt so much fatherly love from, from heaven, and it was like, I don't condemn you. I love you. I love you. It was just love, love. And instantly, that love from God came into me. It was so powerful that the next day I threw away all my drugs. And uh, I quit corn. I was like, I'm quitting corn. And I'm going to raise my kid. Because my kid, like I got the love from God coming to me. And then it came out of me to my kid. It changed me. My heart was changed like that. And I was like, Janae, daddy's going to be home with you all the time. I'm quitting my career. And her face lit up, and she's like, for me? You know, she felt so special, and uh, God used her to save me, to save her life later on. My dream came true way more than I dreamt about. I, got, I made more money. I played bigger shows. I mean, houses, cars. I tried drugs, I tried sex, I tried everything to try to get pleasure out of this life. And I thought that I could fulfill my life with all this stuff by, by having my dream come true. And it came true, but it didn't fulfill it. When Christ came in, that feeling, he gives you the gift of understanding life, which is everything was created for Christ and by him and we're created to be with him. And it's the most incredible feeling because you're where you belong. And contentment is given to you in life because you don't have to look anywhere else. And you're exactly where you need to be. And the question about life is answered. I'm Brian Head Welch, and I'm second. God is still in the business of changing hearts. Changed Brian's life. He can change yours. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father. 
Lord, we just thank you for the testimony that we've seen, Brian, of a life redeemed and a life changed. Father, help our eyes to be open. Help us not to be blind to what you are doing, what you have been doing, what you will be continuing to do, and what you can do. We will choose to believe. Father, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation.